This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. All right, everybody, we got something really special for you. One, we have a outdoor podcast, meaning our podcast, the, today's podcast was recorded outdoors. It's the only podcast you can get where someone gets a hog in the podcast. So stay tuned for that. And then there's something even more special at the end of this very special podcast because we're going to be releasing for free a chapter of Meat Eaters American History, The Long Hunters, which covers that little slice of American history that occurred between 1761 and 1775 when fellas like the famed Daniel Boone were making their living hunting for white-tailed deer skins in the first far west. So the chapter we're going to stick in is called Gearing Up. It's about the blade tools, firearms, and other implements employed by the famed long hunters. So enjoy the show, and at the end... Again, listen to chapter seven of Meat Eaters American History, The Long Hunters. If you like it, and you will, then you can head over to Audible or Apple Books or wherever you get your books and pick it up. It's an audio original, not available in print, only available to listen to. Enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. It's a little different. Because we have to keep it at a very low volume, which is going to make it hard if I get fired up. You know, the comedian Mitch Hedberg observed that he didn't like camping because when he got in a fight with his girlfriend, it was hard to express his anger because he couldn't slam the door and he had to just try to zip the tent real hard. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of like hanging up a smartphone now. Yeah. Like you can't slam it. No, you can't. Throw it. Yeah. In the old days, you'd be like, well, okay then, Mom. <laughs> I'm coming home right now. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. No. And so if I get fired up, you won't know. The listener won't know because here's the problem. We're actually hunting right now. We've done shows ice fishing, and you can talk all you want. But this is a hunting episode. We're we're hunting hogs in Texas. You yeah, could say, whatever. Like, yeah, all it, of them. it's like in Texas everything's always open. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know when they say, you could probably think of other examples. Chris Gill, uh, when Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential came out, they said a rare glimpse <clears throat> into kitchen culture. And I'm trying to think of other documentaries or whatever books so, are a rare glimpse yeah you can't think of any examples i mean almost any documentary you a know? rare glimpse into <laughs> you know a rare peek behind the curtain yeah this is a rare peek into a texas hog hunt or deer hunt because we're in texas we're about as south texas as you can get we're on what'd you just do nothing i'm just looking at levels is that oh, a deer? You messed no, with that. No, it's a fat pig. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh. Don't pass the cow there. Where is it? How far? Way oh, the way hell there. Way yeah. Down. That's a boat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and Corinne remembered. Get a shot of that. You got it. Let me see it. This, this, rare, this rare glimpse into a hog hunt involves a, rifle, a borrowed rifle <laughs> that we've determined... Uh, you can't adjust the scope. No, it's maxed out. It's maxed out. So God, that guy's fat. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta little, aim little high, little to the left <laughs> on close pigs. Now you gotta aim no, gotta low aim and low and, right. low and right. Oh, sorry, low and right on close pigs. It hits high left. Uh, we're about as south of Texas as you can get. Um, the nearest major town is Brownsville, which is a crossing. There's a crossing into Matamoros, Mexico. We're closer to Raymondville. We're on a chunk of Eturia, 
which is a very old, very large ranch that has been, you know, Eturia is portioned into different ownership. The, uh, it says on this chair, 1858. Yeah. Yeah. We're sitting in Eturia chairs. From 1858. Just on the right of the cow. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm buddies with a gentleman that, whose family owns this part of this ranch that we're on. And we've been down here. This is uh, the third time I've come down for the whitetail rut. So it's a big, big place. Um, a lot of, it's a big place. A lot of te Texas properties are managed for deer. Uh, this place, you wouldn't really say that. So there's no feed. They don't, they don't do any kind of feeding. They don't have any deer feeders out. They don't have any kind of deer blinds. Um, it's not fenced, uh, and it, but it gets hunted a bit, but it's just real, you know, they run cattle on it. Um, but it's a, a real chill, relaxed, very cool property. And we've come down here a few times right before Christmas, which is when the peak rut down here is going on. And we've had extraordinary success rattling bucks down here um during this week great success rattling bucks the week before christmas this year we mixed it up a little bit because we brought down a dsd uh listeners will know dave smith decoys because dave smith was on the podcast we brought down a dsd deer decoy so it's like a fight postured buck um and over the course of three days, we rattled in over 30 bucks. There's a little uh, lizard eating some sort of caterpillar right here on this. Oh. Oh, cool. Right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, is oh, that an like anole? An anole. Yeah, brown yeah. anole. Is no, that... he's not an anole. He's different. He just shot up. I just watched him eat uh, some sort of caterpillar. Season's probably in on those. <laughs> it's Texas. <Texting. laughs> um... What was I saying? Sorry. How many bucks you rattled? Oh, rattled in a lot of bucks. But this year we used this decoy. We actually had two bucks come in and level the decoy, <laughs> come in and attack the decoy. And all those bucks come in, virtually probably every one of those bucks came in and bristled his hair up and like postured and whether or not they got nervous and left or whatever, but in some way or another acknowledged, engaged with that decoy, which is pretty fascinating. And got a couple of pigs. And now we're recording the show. And so we came out to, we're out in a big pasture. And we came out to a spot where we're in like a corner of brush. This is real brush country. We're in a brushy little corner. Uh, and some mesquite. Looking out over an open pasture. There's a bunch of cattle out there. There's some horses somewhere around here. I can't see them right now. And a lot of hogs, we picked this corner because a lot of hogs come through this corner, we've noticed. And we got our DSD buck decoy out there, even though we're not really actively buck hunting right now. Oh, I think the pigs are... Are they about, wrapping around? They're about to round the corner. Oh, shit. So just to give you a flavor, Seth's going to go ahead, hit a little rattle. Seth's going to take a couple actual oh, horns. Maybe them rattling. Horns. So we got a couple. What I'm holding here are two horns off a four point buck so two horns off a michigan eight and we bone sawed the eye guards brow tines off it to make it more comfortable gripping and seth's going to do a quick little rattle session here just so you can get the flavor for what's going on No. 
Okay, that was the rattle sash. Now, Seth, give your formula how you think about it. Um, I just rattle for a bit like that. Every once in a while, I'll give a couple grunts. But typically, like, if they're within earshot, they're they're in, like, shooting range within seconds. Yeah, like, so as, as long as you just heard him rattle, we'll, we'll get to an area and we'll creep into an area and get set up and, like, park, creep into an area, get set up, and usually... I would say half of the half of the bucks that show up show up before you've completed oh yeah your first rattle session yep and, and they they run in and then they like will pump the brakes maybe 40 yards anywhere from 10 to 50 yards from where the noise is yeah to try to get a read on the situation it got to the point where like when bucks didn't show up we were like what's wrong yeah yeah it's, it was weird when we had nothing show up. So I, I do that, um, depending on the setup, but typically three different times. I'll rattle, I'll have a break for about a minute, and I'll rattle again. And I would say, I don't know, 25% of the time, bucks would come in on the second one. Mm -hmm. And then... I would take another break and then rattle for like a third sequence. And I don't think we ever had bucks come in on the third sequence. No. Uh, a typical sash, we probably don't sit 12 minutes. Yeah. Because it's like something still might happen, but it's like I'd rather just go to a new spot. Yeah. That last session yesterday, the third rattle worked, I think. Yeah. You know, oh, that was the, oh, did it? That yeah. was the crazy. Yeah, but okay, it did. You're right. But what's funny is one also came in within seconds. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> that was we, just pure chaos. Yeah, at That's dusk cool. last night we had a rattle set we had our best rattle session at dusk last night and called in four bucks. Now these are not big bucks. They're like nice bucks, but they're not huge bucks. We called in four bucks last night and Seth got one with some stickers on them, so he was a ten point turn thirteen. Yeah. Like a Michigan ten that had three kickers. A genuine 13-pointer. There's a cold deer. Yeah. yeah. Super cold deer. Then this morning we went out and rattled again, and I arrowed one. I arrowed the seventh buck that came in this morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm anywhere else, that's like, it's insane. It's, <laughs> it's just crazy. How many sets did we have this morning? Was it? Oh, this morning? Yeah, was it four? Well, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll pull up my stats. Three or four? So here's my stats. Um, on day one, we did nine sets. On day one, we did nine sets. We did nine rattle sessions. Oh, yeah, there are two pigs right there. And rattled in seven bucks. On day two, we did 14. We were being turn and burn. Turn, turn and, and burn, burn baby. Turn and burn. We did 14 <laughs> setups and rattled in seven. We rattled in 21 bucks. Dude. Way better but ratio. we were cranking that yeah. day. <laughs> Everything from forkies, forkies to little basket tens. Yeah. And and you, and changed the strategy as far as separation. Yeah. Got it the figured wind. out. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll talk about that in one second. Right. Then, today, we killed a buck on the seventh setup, which was two, three, four, five. Seven setups. And killed the seventh buck on the nice. seventh setup. Seven, seven. Nice. Today. Today. Yeah. Um, we tried a bunch of different ways of going about this. Uh, this little strategy talk, if you want to try this. Um, we would set up together. Okay. So the rattle guy and the bow guy next to each other. The problem you'd have is, is you know, animals, like, you know, when people say with turkeys that when you're calling to a turkey, that turkey knows what tree you're under. Yeah. And he knows when he hears it from 200 yards away, he knows what tree it is and what side of that tree you're on. Mm -hmm. I read a good line in, in Little Big Man where a guy was talking about how good someone is at tracking. 
And he said, when he looks at the ground, he can tell what birds flew overhead. (laughs) (laughs) So they know where, they know where that noise is coming from. So when you rattle and the buck comes busting in, he knows exactly where to look. He knows exactly where he's looking and he might see the decoy. But he's looking from the decoy to where the noise is, from the decoy to where the noise is. He's, he sees the buck, the decoy buck, but he also is like, well, where is the thing that was fighting? So then we started trying to spread out by a bit. What happened? Oh, it's just a big, fat black hawk right there. Far out or close? No, like right there. How right there? At the tree edge. That's the tree edge. I don't know. Can you get a shot of him? I don't know. Oh, you know, yeah, I could, you mean the other side of the thing or our side? Our side. How many yards? He's walking out. I'm bad at estimating. He's like at the tree line over there. Here, let me give you a range finder. Just poke out and range him. This place is crawling with pigs right now like you wouldn't believe. Um, Hit measure twice. Crin's gonna go get a range on him. I flip it. Turn, turn it the other way. There you go. So, what we eventually hit on was, if there's any appreciable wind, like we would want to go here. Here, when we first started doing this, we would always think, okay, you're gonna approach the area with the wind in your face, of course, and then you're gonna rattle. Like, like, just like setting up with a predator call. When you set up with a predator call, you want the wind in your face and you're looking into the wind or crossways, knowing that that coyote is going to come and want to get downwind of you, but you're looking upwind because when he gets downwind, it's going to be too late. You're trying to catch him working his way to get downwind. It's like between 130 and 150. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty far. I mean, for, for our iron, it's pretty far. <laughs> so get a shot and then shoot iron. So, uh, ah, but that, uh, so we eventually hit on was when those bucks come into that, what's wrong? Oh, oh, right here. Oh shit. Kren. How do I plug my ears, my headphones on? Easy, easy. No, no, get a He's rest. keyed get up. Rest on your knees. He's keyed up. He's keyed up. Chamber the round. Chamber the round. She did. Oh. He's definitely keyed up, but he's not going anywhere. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time. Uh, Corinne just ran off. <laughs> pretty sure that, that might be the first time there's ever been a pig hunt during a podcast. <laughs> that might be. That just might be. Holy shit. Might have to go. Might have to. Did, do you, a little... did you see what kind of hit she got on? I couldn't tell. He didn't go down. It was a boar. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we might have to do a little intermission. All right. We're going to have to pause for a second. Can they pause? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. I got no idea what they can and can't do. Got good coverage of them, though. Did you? Oh, yeah. Good work. Might have. Might have jolted a little bit with that rifle shot. Can you hear him? Garrett went out and he's currently, I think, looking for blood. Shot of Garrett looking for blood. Okay. All right, Seth. Well, well, what do you want to talk about, buddy? <laughs> I mean, that was nuts. That's why this this shoot has been fun because we've just been seeing so many bucks doing buck stuff. Yeah, doing buck stuff. Doing doing stuff that you rarely get to see. Ooh. Second shot. Wasn't ready for that. (laughs) I'll shat my knickers. Yeah, don't... uh, yeah, that was the second shot. Assuming that's the same pig. Potentially a different pig. I'd say it's dead now. I, yeah, I think we're probably pretty. Probably should send an email to Phil. Yeah. 
letting him know. Hey, Phil. Um, Got to chop about. Hopefully chunk. not much longer here. There's We're going to come back, folks. I tell you. There's a chunk of that podcast, Phil, that's you, probably not usable. You know, like, what does Al Michaels do, you know, if they can't go to commercial and there's like a player down or something and they got to just talk? You know what I mean? Oh, like yeah. Like during yeah, a they game? Start, they like start talking about stats and yeah. stuff and whatnot. Yeah. You got any stats on hand? Well, the, the, the impressive stats. Oh, here's Steve. Steve's coming back. Steve said yeah, already. How many bucks? Oh, Steve here. Steve just picked up a nice bullet casing. Here they come. I'm sure they have a story. So do we have a dead pig or what? Oh, Corinne's going to tell, tell your hunting story, Corinne. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Corinne. <laughs> hey, w- w- yeah, well, we'll get to it. I'm curious about that second shot because me and Seth were not ready for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> that makes three of us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Every day I vow to like start getting real serious about hearing protection and I'm like, <laughs> I'm in the middle of being like, okay, you know, uh-huh. get a good. Re- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the experience That's that I had. Oh, she did that the other day. <laughs> I'm like, I'm giving her like a motivational speech. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so where, where's the pig? It's there. She, it's, it's, uh, we just left land for now. Yeah. We'll go get it in a minute. Okay. Tell your hunting story, Corinne. <laughs> Well, As we got the all, first part. Yeah, move, move your mic closer. As anyone who's observing on YouTube could tell that I just abandoned my seat. Um, if you're not watching on YouTube, you should pause this and <laughs> yeah, you should you <laughs> should hit a computer wait, real quick. Wait till you get home and watch on YouTube. <laughs> no, don't say that. Uh, finish this and then rewatch. There you, there go. you go. There <laughs> it is. Um, as I was ranging two or three different pigs, one just was like way too close. And then I just kind of mm-hmm. couldn't help it. No, and <laughs> drew, I drew a bead. I I didn't I didn't make the best shot, even though it was really really close. It would have died. I mean, it's I guess part of yeah. She's yeah, hit a but, little far back. We found it standing back in there. We mm. went in there. Dirt found a little blood, and we went back in there and it was standing there. And then uh, I was trying to explain to Kren where our, the head was, and she apparently already knew. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <Uh-oh. And, laughs> I hadn't put my hearing protection in yet. <laughs> and that second <laughs> gave Sorry, me a Steve. nice muscle break to the Ooh. to my my mostly impaired ear. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, whoops. I was a bit impulsive. I knew it, it dropped. Was, like, I knew it you'll, wasn't. You'll notice the head off to the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I feel oh, like if you get if you're at the point where you're telling Corinne like what she needs to be doing, she already knows. She's already good. She's uh-huh. already doing it. Yeah. I think yeah, I'm going to graduate her in my mind up to that position. Yeah. yeah. And not like I'm so sorry. And not like I'm talking to my son. Yeah. I I learned that real Thanks, quick dude. the other day when I was like, "All right, when he steps out." <laughs> <laughs> All right, he stepped out enough for her. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's good. This this is a, like a pig funnel. Oh, it's so much nicer oh, yeah. than the other one. I mean, you think? I think every time we come through here, there's pigs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See them Do you think they're they could more could come through now after post? I guarantee it. Nice. Yeah. So that even though I said I'm not like a great uh, ju- judge of pigs. Yeah. You know, I said it looked like a little boar. Yeah. It's not big old sow. Sow. <laughs> but it's like yesterday the one I got. Uh, I got the coveted uh, pregnant sow, mm. which is when they get body fat. What you don't want one is nursing, because they nur- you know mm. get nursed mm. and that mm-hmm. and that's a stout. That's that feels like the of the three we've d- butchered. That feels like the best one. Oh really? Oh, this good. one here. That feels to me like oh, the really better than yours. Oh yeah, I like in feeling it's. This is some lean country here. Like mm-hmm. I said, there's no yeah. they, there's no feeders here or anything. It's just lean country, mm-hmm. and uh, the pigs here are just bones. You know, uh, my boy got a couple one time. Man, they were just hard to like really get anything off. But should we get the shooting iron handy? If we, if we go, if you're trying to get a second, I'm pig. good on pigs. Do you need? Do you want? I'm good. Uh, you good on pigs, Grin? Yeah. Yeah, we're good on okay. pigs. Pigs on pigs on's over. Okay, it's a success. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, now awesome. we can do the podcast. <laughs> Oh yeah, where was I? Where was I talking about? Oh, our setups. So th- 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 this is our findings so far on rattling, which we've put in a fair bit of uh, attention to at this point. So let me recap. I got a little <laughs> rattled. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you still hear that ringing no, in your ears? No, not that kind of rattle. <laughs> uh, what I was, I was explaining that we would at a time set up together, but they they were too keyed in. So then we would try to get a little distance between the rattle and get a little distance between the rattling and the spot. And our thinking was, our thinking was we were kind of wanting to look into the wind because you were looking at areas that you hadn't already put odor to Mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, when, if the ones that are behind that are downwind aren't coming. So you'd look up you know, and we're approaching into the wind too. So we're approaching into the wind. Imagine we've disturbed what what's behind us. We're now calling to things that we haven't walked through and to things that haven't gotten our odor. And so we would set up like that. But what we kept finding is um, it's thick enough country that they're, they're playing that wind from a little ways out and they're showing up consistently downwind, making their kind of like almost like running in to a downwind position and then they stop often they stop when they see that decoy they pump the brakes on which is good because if you don't have the decoy sometimes you find they just run through and never stop so we eventually hit on this idea where the rattler sets up downwind from the rattler um the rattler sets up upwind from the decoy so the rattler is 40, 30, 40, would you say? 30 yards, 20 yards? Depending on the setup, but mm-hmm. yeah. Anywhere from, I would say, 15 yards to 30 yards. Yeah. The rattler is 15 to 30 yards from the decoy. And the rattler is, the decoy is downwind of the rattler. And then the archer wants to set up 15 to 30 down from the decoy. Which when that buck comes in and he's, and he's staring at that, when that buck comes in and he's staring at that location where that rattling is or registers the decoy, he's in your zone, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's thick. So you can't, you know, you can't see everything. You kind of got to pick your lanes, but he's likely to come in and stop 10 yards, 15 yards from where you're at. What's funny is you'd think, well, what happens when the buck stops between the archer and the rattler? which is exactly what we did today. I actually had to take my shot before I wanted to, because if he took another step or two, I would have shot Seth with my bow. <laughs> yeah. It would have already be a bloody arrow. I'm glad you didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it would have gone through the deer and then into Seth. <laughs> Which, whatever. You know. not a, <laughs> no big deal. Probably not a second pass through. <laughs> Probably just would have went through the guts. And... No. Uh, You'd be all right. Yeah. So, but it worked beautifully. Oh, yeah. I think that that is the system for rattling in thick country. Running running and gunning rattling in thick country. Um, And it, it, you know what it winds up being? It's You know what it's so similar to? It's so similar to Jason Phelps elk hunting strategy Mm -hmm. the way he likes to hunt bulls is he'll if he finds a bull bedded or finds a midday bull he likes to sneak into like where that thing is not where that thing can't ignore it where it can't ignore a bugle yep like he's not going to go 300 yards to check out a bugle he's just not he might bugle in return but he's not going to get up and go and he's not going to get out of his bed necessarily and walk but when, when you rip a bugle 50 yards, he's going to get up. Yeah. You're in his face. And for, for like running and gunning, rattling, um, all you're really trying, like what, what you're doing is you're standing those bucks up and they're bounding in. I don't know what, they're coming from 100 yards. It's an interesting strategy in any situation where if you knew you had deer, uh, you knew you had a buck bedded anywhere. Illinois, Michigan, whatever. Yep. If you knew you had a buck bedded that you might approach like that, get in there with a buddy, get in there and be like, when I rattle, get ready. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we're in his zone. 
It, yeah. And it, he might be like, what in the world's going on? You know? It'd be fun to try that in other places than here. Like, than it's not going to be as good. It's not going to be as good as here because there's, no. there's so many deer and the buck to doe. It seems like there's more bucks than does. Yeah. It, there's not. We've it's probably equal, but it's just. We've definitely seen more bucks than does, you know, 100%. And it's like prime time, all that, but it could it would be it would be something that I would try in other situ in other situations. Yeah. You know, it's something I would try in other situations. Is run and gun, run and gun rattling. I'm gonna trademark that. Turn and burn rattling. Turn and burn. Turn and burn. Turn and burn. Yeah. Well it's also cool being on the ground that close to them. You know, oh, like yeah. it's different than being up in a tree. Being up in a tree is cool too, but there's just something about being on eye level with them when they come in. It's pretty it's pretty cool. Getting to see every hair that's standing up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that that's, that's so cool. That's one of the most surprising things is if you look at the Dave Smith decoy, deer decoy, it's meant to look like bristled and he, it's got a really interesting texture to it. But when those deer come in and they see that decoy, it's just like, like you picture a turkey coming in and seeing a, a strutter decoy. Mm -hmm. What's he going to do? He's going to pop up. Yeah. yeah. He comes in, he's like, right. He comes in at first, like picture a Tom coming in where he's like, sure hope no one tries to kill me. <laughs> sure hope no one tries to kill me mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden he sees a decoy and he's like oh <laughs> yeah you know forgets everything yeah feathers pop out like these bucks come in they see that decoy and they they go into full strut yeah oh it's wild and yeah. they have such a strange They're, they cock their ears back they start tipping their head two of them started kicking dirt yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. two like, of them works two of them work scrapes or made a scrape yep yeah. and they're like drooling yeah, a lot yeah, of drooling lot and of licking drooling. their lips, man. Lot licking of, their lips. A lot of it. And then they like... They look like my kid's going into a McDonald's. They go <laughs> they go from like a normal a normal deer like walking in to like stop, see the decoy, and then it's like slow motion. Yeah. yeah. All the way in. All of his hair standing out and they shiver it. Yeah. <laughs> Tail jammed down between their legs like a G-string. Mm -hmm. The yeah. second time I used that, <laughs> second time I used yeah, G-string in an hour. Recently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not every day. No, I go months without talking about mm -hmm. a G-string, and I've had two occasions <laughs> in the last hour. Yeah. Was it related? <laughs> Guitar, one of them. Not the well, one, just <laughs> the joke. The joke, not my joke, but a joke I heard. I was trying to, I was messing with a guitar and remembered a person, a former podcast guest who I'll not identify saying the only instrument I ever learned how to play was a, uh, and I was telling that, sharing that, and then uh, use it again now. His tail tucked in like a G-string. Yep. Um, hair puffed out, shaking, head cocked, and a lot of lip licking. Yeah. <laughs> And coming at it from all angles. And here's another thing from the, the, that surprised me. Like, you picture two bucks fighting that they're going to hit heads, right? Well, if you have a decoy that's stationary, you see what the buck would prefer to do. Because the decoy can't turn to, to face it. So the buck kind of gets like, a, are you really honestly going to let me do this? And the buck pulls up alongside. Both bucks that attack the decoy because it's not turning to meet them right in the ribs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like he's trying to stab it. Yeah. He's like, if you're really going to let me do this, <laughs> I'm, I'm going <laughs> to give you all eight of my tines into your rib cage yeah. is what both those bucks yeah, did. It's like that. It's like the buck knows where it needs to hit the other buck to kill it. Yep. Yeah. And it's like, if you just let the deer do its thing, it's like, they're like just trying to kill each other. Yeah, but no buck on his right mind in his right mind is gonna actually let another buck yeah, do it. Exactly. So you think they always meet head to head. But he pulls up alongside and um and they pull up alongside and they stare and one got his head really close, but then they when they charge, there's no announcement. Mm -mm. Like when they snap and go for it, it's out of the blue. Mm-hmm. I feel like that first one kind of pulled up and almost looked the decoy in the eye first. Yeah. She like kind of yeah. turned and like eye to eye with him and then went for it. I think our decoy eventually started to smell too much like Seth. <laughs> yeah, from Carrie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carrie. Yeah, carry hauling that thing all over the place. And they yeah. started to get suspicious. And then we took uh, a guy that uses the DSD deer decoys was telling me, when you kill a buck, take the tarsal glands. 
off that buck and rub it into your decoy and then just stole the tarsal glands under the decoy. So we got some buck glands, but then a dog stole them. Yeah. That would have been cool to see that reaction, like pre rubbing it and post rubbing it. Yeah. See what, what, how many more. Sure. Yeah. There was one buck today that would look like it was going to mix it up with that decoy. And, uh, my take on his body language is he was not buying that smell. Yeah. I I agree. He got close and put his nose out and got his nose maybe three feet from that thing. Mm -hmm. And his hair just flattened out. Yeah. And then he walked off. Yeah. Like he lost all of his. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tough to get that thing odorless just because you have, it's like, you really got to bear hug it to move yeah, it around. It's, it's, it's not that easy to carry around just because it's like a full size deer decoy. And I would most of the time just like throw it over my shoulder because I was also carrying other stuff, rattling antlers and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, I think it, if maybe if we had like some sort of spray to like spray it down real good. Yep. And then rub it down with the with the tarsal glands. Yeah, I think if you took a bottle of rubbing alcohol and gave it a little rub down and then tarsal glanded it, it'd be badass. Do they bottle that tarsal gland scent? Like, they make do they make they do, they yeah. make yeah. scents, yeah. But I kinda it's just much more badass to rub it with your own deer's oh, tarsal glands, yeah. man. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's a good if you're in a spot where you can get a doe or you like an Ernabuck state or something, you know, like get the well, the does don't have the tarsal glands though, huh? No, yeah. not stinky ones. Yeah. And those bucks. Oh, we you know I, we should clarify because you don't come on the show enough. Um, Chris Gill's here. Hi everybody. And uh, Dirt's here. Hello. And Corinne. Um, and of course Seth. Uh, did you notice how many of those bucks stank? Yeah. Like when a buck comes through, and then he leaves, it's his. It lingers. lingers. Yeah. It lingers in the air, man. Yeah. And that buck that I had kind of to scare because I thought it was going to hit us. It smelled the whole time. Oh, he got close. I was like, buddy, you got to take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Just a stinky buck. Yeah, I smelled the the, the drop tine buck that we were after today. Mm-hmm. I smelled him real good. He was stanky. Mm-hmm. A lot of different personalities, though. Yeah, yeah. A, lot of different, a lot of different responses. Um, it felt, we didn't have enough, a huge sample size, but it felt like bigger bucks were less likely to commit suicide yep you know makes sense more likely to check stuff out yeah Yeah, more likely to check stuff out seth you remember you're familiar with saint anthony to find something right Mm -hmm. okay check this story out so when we just did the live tour a guy told me the story that i met Mm -hmm. at the live show and then he emailed the story because i said email me that story because it's a great story we're talking about what explain saint anthony i had never heard of this um, I, I I honestly don't know what Saint Anthony. He's the saint of lost items. Saint, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I, I always, when, growing up, if I lost something, my grandmother would always say, "You, you got to say Saint Anthony, Saint Anthony, please come around. Something's been lost and cannot be found." And if you say that, it's like a little prayer type thing. Oh, moo cow, this is not moo. And if you say that, you'll you'll find whatever you're looking for. Well, let me back you up on that. This guy. Uh, long, it's kind of a convoluted story, but the, the, the quick of it is they were out checking trail camps a couple hours from home, Mm -hmm. lose the truck keys. Oh, Oh. so this guy and his body lose their truck keys and they look and look and look and look for the truck keys. Um, trying to call someone and you're proposing to their buddies that like you, you, how about you make a four hour drive? (laughs) Oh, a tough sell yeah you know. anyways they go all the way back to the where the trail cam was and the tree stand was he says real thick grass and vegetation back and forth can't find it and he does the the anthony prayer the guy that didn't lose the guy accompanying the guy that lost his keys that's who's telling me the story yep. he's accompanying his buddy his buddy's lost his keys he does his saint Th- saint anthony prayer they're looking and all of a sudden the guy's phone rings. The guy that lost his keys phone rings. So he stops to converse on the phone. And while he's conversing on the phone, realizes that there's his keys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, now, 
Who do you think it was that called the man? His buddy Anthony. Exactly. Really? Oh, <laughs> man. My God. That is good, exactly. man. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. He's like, I heard you. Exactly. Yeah, I'd hold on to that, buddy. Yeah, there's- I lose shit all the time. There's something about- Oh, yeah. Something about that. At the end of this episode, you are going to hear chapter seven- for free, you're going to hear Chapter 7 of Meat Eaters American History, The Long Hunters. I'm very excited about this. Oh, you should be. Oh, I'm like, from what I've heard, very excited. It's perhaps one of the things, I used to tell people the thing I'm most proud of that I made, my best work was uh, my Buffalo book because I was at the height of my powers as a writer because I didn't have any other thing going on in my life. Um, that's all I was doing. It's just for two years. I just worked on that book. My life was really simple. No kids, wasn't married. Um, it was just different back then. Coyotes. 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 That big old bull. Go out and grab hold of that big old bull. <laughs> that's a big old bull. I actually thought that those were the udders. But... That's just one. <laughs> She's not. like, he's only got one udder. Oh my God. No, Milk it long enough. Oh there are two udders. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, he does got two. Yeah, he always got two. You know? Damn. He's posing for us. God. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh,. <laughs> God's a stout looking critter. Man, in this thorn <laughs> country? <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> so Long Hunters uh is pretty is really good. It's really good. Um I believe it. It's narrated, it's audio only. So it's not people should understand it's not a print book. It's an audio original narrated by myself and Clay Newcomb, exhaustively researched by Dr. Randall. Um I'm also excited that you and Clay are narrating it because when you hear like audiobooks or whatever and somebody else is reading it, you've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. It's like it just kind of, it can be a real good or bad thing for the story. Here's what we found in working on it is. That's not a close. God, I almost feel like we should get the predator there, call yeah. out and bring Hi. him in here. So. Oh, that's a good point. That's, I wouldn't worry about that yet. Um, what the hell was I saying? Oh, uh, you know, books, a, bu a book that's meant to, that's written to be read is best read. It's best that you read it. Something that you're listening to is just different. So when we made the long hunters, like meteors, American history is meant to be presented. It's meant to be read. It's meant to be, uh, it's meant to be listened to. It was like built specifically to be listened to, which kind of makes it special. And we do all the narration on it. Um, it's really good. So we're going to put chapter seven, which is called gearing up. It's about the equipment used by the long hunters at the end of this episode to further titillate you and prompt you to go and wherever you buy your books, um, and pick your copy up, download your copy for listening. Cats and schizophrenia. This is not a... <laughs> This is Real not a big pivot. Wasn't ready for that. Either. That was like, kind of like that gunshot, man. <laughs> An academic study just came out. I felt when I saw this article, I really thought it was meant for Steve's eyeballs. Cat, are you ready for this? You mm -hmm. cat man? No, very far from a cat man. You cat man? Dog man. Nah. No cat man no here. Cat. I have, well, my wife has a cat. You're a cat man. I'm certainly not a cat man. He's a cat You man. come around. Yeah. He's a cat man. I don't touch the cat. Well, Seth, you might be curious to hear this. Depends. Or, or not not curious. You might be alarmed to hear this as Depends a cat. What happens as to a the cat, cat, man. I had a cat named Fig the Cat. <laughs> we had a cat named Maud when I was a kid, and Maud had its babies in my dad's boot and ate them all. Ooh. Hmm. Dang. We had a cat named Fig, and I always like to tell the story that my dad, my, we tamed a stray cat. My dad tamed it by leaving fish heads out for it. Cleaning fish, he'd leave the heads out. And he loved this cat. I don't know why. It's the only cat. Well, he liked that cat, Maud, too. But he brought Fig over to his buddy who was a hog farmer. And this hog farmer has castrated thousands of hogs. He bought Fig over so that that guy could castrate Fig. 
and they put they cut a little hole in a gunny sack, put fig in that gunny sack, and snaked his little berries out of the oh. hole in that gunny sack. Well, the cat fought him off. Oh my God. <laughs> They, he's castrated hundreds of hogs. Couldn't castrate that cat. <laughs> that got cat claws. got out of there with just a little nick in his scrotum and <laughs> never got fixed. Because there's no way there, my dad's going to spend money on that. If his buddy couldn't do it, it wasn't. So that cat just like won the battle. And procreated. Oh. Yeah. And that, I, that I, cat would leave for sometimes. He'd go on like a 10-day hiatus. Oh, yeah. And then he'd come right down the stairs, come back home. <laughs> I, had a, I had an old barn cat um, named Wild Bill, and he would do the same thing. He'd go on like two-week walkabouts. Be <laughs> Just <gone>. be gone. <laughs> he'd be gone. He'd come back. One time I caught him in a foothold by accident in a fox set. Oh, I caught my own cat one time. I let him out. <laughs> Didn't phase him. He'd still go on walkabouts with a little limp. <laughs> we caught our own caught cat. Caught your own cat? We caught our own trap? cat trapping. Was that in like a possum a set? Trap? Oh. No, a foot trap. Possum yeah, foot, set. Just foot caught our own cat in a possum set. Let him out, and he just followed us around. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I was where you guys are going to show up. <laughs> Let him out of there. He just tagged along with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, anyways, listen to this thing. Cat ownership and schizophrenia-related disorders and psychotic-like experiences. Correlate? Correlate to cat ownership. Why? It doesn't surprise me. Why, you ask? Because of something that you may have learned about listening to this very podcast, the Meat Eater podcast. We did an episode on cat scratch fever. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Because we had a guy on, Danny Bolton came on. What was that shit called again? Tox. 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 Yeah. That's why pregnant ladies shouldn't clean litter boxes, right? When they say that, if you're pregnant, don't if you yeah. have a cat. Toxo. Yeah. Danny Bolton got toxoplasmosis from eating raw, I can't remember if it was goat or lamb. It was goat. goat. Raw oh. goat. goat. And yeah. so there's a ton of feral cats in Hawaii. So that cat shit had somehow gotten on whatever and he ate it. And toxoplasmosis has been linked to um, jackals. No, what is it? Jackals? Oh. Or is it? What's that other wild ass looking dog in Africa? Hyena. Hyenas. Right. Hyenas that have toxoplasmosis are more likely to be killed by lions. They're just risky. They just, yeah. Bold. Yeah. People yeah. that. Um, you're more likely to die in an automobile accident if you've had toxoplasmosis. It removes your fear. Yep. But it also apparently removes your ability to not, um, can impact your psychological state and toxoplasmosis can link to schizophrenia related outcomes. That's so yeah. when you hear it, when New Jersey cat ladies come to mess with you, oh, there's a reason why they're by the, the crazy why cat ladies. Reason yeah. why? No fear. So, so this is after you ready they, for the conclusions? This is after they recover from it. Our findings support an association between cat exposure and an increased risk of broadly defined schizophrenia-related disorders. How are the findings related to PLE as an outcome or mixed? There is need for more high quality. Just never mind all that. I like to stick with the narrative. <laughs> I don't want to read all the disclaimers because mm-hmm. I, I want to uh, paint a damning portrait of cat ownership. <laughs> it's like mainstream media. But in all fairness, <laughs> they say there is a need for more high quality studies in this field because there's some uncertainty. But still, do you do you know how cats get like? Because not every cat has toxoplasmosis, or you no. can get. So, like, what is it? Outdoor cats are more. I would imagine that cats that have more of a chance to interact with cats, yeah, can, yeah, get it. If you nabbed a cat out of a, you know, right out of the womb, and never let it see another cat, it's probably had a low likelihood of getting toxoplasmosis. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the book. You want to see another hard change? Yeah. I'm a big fan of the book. Life and Death at the Mouth of the Muscle Shell. Oh, me too. I love that book. And an and, and area that now sits underneath the water because of an impoundment. Um, but it was a journal of a guy who spent time at the mouth of the, where the muscle shell flows into the Missouri. Like I said, now it's flooded, lays at the bottom of Fort Peck Reservoir. 
Um, and I had talked on the podcast before about the amount of just bloodshed in that book. Well, a guy read it and he made a uh, guy, uh, audience member read it and built a spreadsheet where he could track all the killings. Mm, this is going to be interesting. You want to hear some totals? Yeah. When you read Life and Death of the Mouse of the Muscle Shell, you will read about 1,474 dead wolves. Whoa. Jeez. Because in that book, they're always going out and lacing buffalo carcasses with strychnine. Yep. Wolfing. And they'll be like, we went to Bob's Bait and had 24. One day, I can't remember what tribe it was. One day, one of the Plains tribes comes into the fort and they are mighty pissed because their dogs all got killed. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're like, stop putting that poison out. Killed all their dogs. 1,474 wolves. 468 antelope, 128 buffalo, 121 Indians, 34 whites, among many other things that are the deaths of which are described in Life and Death of the Mouth of the Muscle Shell. So that's the number of deaths that occur in his time in his journal. He, wow. He didn't tell wow. the bears. They did a fair, fair amount of why. bear killing. Yeah, and they'd be like, we got on to three... And everybody shot a bunch and couldn't find any of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they killed a lot of grizzlies. Round six got two. Yep. What uh, what years does that take place during that journal? Uh, he's there in the late in the early eighteen seventies. Yeah, it's something on the muscle shell is hunting this fall up there, and it's that kind of like more north of Great Falls. Mm-hmm. It's like kind of you know sagebrushy, gumbo type landscape. Mm-hmm. Big old grizz print in the bottom of this like, oh, dried right? out dry. Yeah. Really? It was a grizz track. Yeah. 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 I'll show you the picture. It's kind of freaky. Really? Yeah. Well, he notices, They're known to be there. He notices, too, that some you can tell some stuff about migrations back then. In, uh, so a real spike in antelope. There's an, in November 1871, so 103 years before I was born. They killed 223 antelope out of that fort in November. Jeez. Wow. I, I remember that part of the book, and it was a big deal. Everybody's going up and killing all the antelope. Thousands yep. of antelope hanging out by the fort. Uh, thank you, Craig, for sending that in. Yeah, that's cool. Now, here's another little stats thing. A lot of stats today. We got our buck rattling stats, those stats. This kind of blew my mind. So there's a D- in Wisconsin, they have a DNR website that tracks dogs killed by wolves. Okay. This is this this is pretty crazy. So it starts, it must be when they start being able to have the running season. Starting in July 8th. So for instance, July 8, 2023, Burnett County. One hunting dog killed, seven-year-old female blue tick trailing hound. Okay. That's July 8th. July 20, Clark County. One hunting dog killed and one hunting dog injured. Walker trailing hounds. That was July 20. July 21. Lincoln County. One hunting dog killed. Six-year-old female red bone trailing hound. The next day, July 22. Bayfield County. Two hunting dogs killed. A four-year-old male walker trailing hound and an eight-year-old female red bone trailing hound. Seven days later. Burnett County, one hunting dog killed, five-year-old male, blue tick, trailing hound. Four days later, August 3rd, one hunting dog killed, three-year-old plot, trailing hound. Why are they, why are they getting killed in the summer? Because it's wolves killing dogs, running bears. Oh, okay. Mm, that's the bear season? Now, I don't know if this is true, but someone's pointing out cutting the hazard of cutting your hounds loose near bait piles that wolves hitting are hinting and frequenting those bait piles and you're cutting your hounds loose near bait piles and the minute that thing starts cutting out baying or trailing yeah those wolves are pounding it so up so this thing i'm looking at tracks up till this thing I'm tra- I'm looking at tracks up till December, okay? 
Now, the running tally, so in Wisconsin, in these counties in Wisconsin, 25 bear hounds killed and seven bear hounds injured between July and October 2023 in northern Wisconsin. Wow. Jeez. And that's something. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's a number, man. That's a big number. That's just surprising. Every couple days, all, and it peaks like in that September, October, and then yeah. trails off, obviously, when the, in December. Pounding on them trailing dogs. Dang. I don't even know what I think about that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of what I think about that. I can see people saying, if you like your dogs a lot, I wouldn't turn them out on them bears. And I could see someone saying, a lot of wolves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if I want to get back into this thing about the we bird can name. We skip that for now. Oh, God, I'll throw a quick tidbit in. Okay. Well, I'm curious mm-hmm. about it now that you mentioned it. What do you mean? Now that you mentioned you did this bird naming thing. And I'm, did you listen to the show? Not this one. Missed not it. this one. Which episode is it? We, rec- I, I we recently... I to you and Cal and Yanni, Yanni fight, have a, a fight? fight about it. And okay. I, was, I was on your side. The Ornithological Society in the U.S. has moved to rename... 70 bird species. Now, they will periodically rename a bird. For instance, as I pointed out, everyone knows there's a blue grouse, but the Ornithological Society determined that blue grouse was capturing actually two distinct species of grouse. So there became out of blue, became dusky and sooty. Yeah, Mm, makes sense. Um, Everyone knows that the old squaw duck, um, that's a derogatory term. And so, and many people find that term offensive. So the Ornithological Society came in and surgically took that duck and renamed it the Longtail Duck. Now they can't tell you what the hell to call the duck, but it's just their take on it. Yep. Right? It's not you know they're not like the god of birds, but the Ornithological Society moved to form try to formally rename the old squaw to the Longtail, therefore moving it away. Just like I don't know seven or eight. Old, uh, Squaw Peaks, seven or eight, I don't know if it's that, probably more, Squaw Creeks, right? Got new names. Um, and I used to live in Missoula, Montana. One of the primary peaks that you'd see looking mostly west would be Squaw Peak. And I remember maybe it was in the late 90s, early 2000s, it became Sacagawea Peak. There's a Squaw Creek near where I live now that became Storm Castle, which seems like something from The Simpsons. Storm Castle. Well, remember he had Storm King? Was his snow plow? Oh, that was Plow King. Oh, Plow <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, no, that yeah. was Mr. He was Mr. Plow, and then Barney got into it, and he was the Plow King. The plow king. <laughs> he was the competitor to home. Yeah, like Storm Castle, it seems like if you if you got one of those really bad realtors, you know those realtors that does when they do a subdivision yes. and then name it for what it replaced? Yeah. So if there used to be like a bunch of elk meadows, you'd mow that shit down, pave it over, build a bunch of houses, and be like, I'm going to call this subdivision Elk Meadows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to call this subdivision Cattle Country. <laughs> so, yeah, Storm Castle, which seems like a like a make-believe. It reminds me of like, White Castle, like little cheeseburgers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like like a, a place that has a name. Like we used to hunt an area called Froze to Death. I'm like, that's a legit name. <laughs> You can tell that some dude froze to yeah, death found him in there. that area is froze to death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hanging Woman Creek. Let yeah. me guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me guess. Storm Castle? I mean, there's no castles you're storming. I got friends that just can't. I got friends that can't stomach it, and they just and they can't call it that. Yeah. Uh, where was I? I felt that this, oh, so they now have done the big play. And they're like, no more surgical renaming of things. We're going to just rename 70 birds. Any bird named after, like any bird named after a a white European, regardless of what that person stood for or did, um, gets a new name. And I felt and still feel that, one, it's a publicity grab. Two, 
it's a lot. It's not surgical. It's just, it's blunt. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it, it just, it just reeks to me of, it, it reeks to me of a PR stunt. Someone pointed out, an ornithologist pointed out that where this movement is getting some resistance is the international ornithology community who feels that this is a distinctly American idea. Mm. Yeah. Do you have an example of a bird? Mm-hmm. No. Um... Just go listen to the episode, Chris. I will. And the listeners should, too, if they haven't heard it already. So, uh, you know, like that pitch? I'm sure there's birds out there named after... Let me give you an example. Yep. The Stellar's J will no longer be... According to these guys, the Stellar's J will cease to be the Stellar's J. They'll probably be like the iridescent purple J. But when, like... Which is great. Was, they should have named it... I wish they would have named that from the start. Yeah. But at this point... It's there. And hmm. they, they probably named it Stellar's J because some dude named Stellar... His Stella. last name. Because these dudes used to run around naming everything after themselves. Mm -hmm. Stellar did a J. He did a sea lion. He did an eagle. He just named everything after himself. Was was he a bad dude? I don't know. It's just fallen out of favor now. Like, no one names a new bird their own name. But it was the practice in the 1800s. That was a common practice that you would name. That if you scientifically described a species, you would name it. Now, the rationale, I said I wasn't going to revisit this whole thing, and here I am. The rationale is they feel that new birders, new birders who aren't of, who are not of European descent, who aren't a male of, of Western European descent, that new aspiring birders would be turned off to birding when they saw this crazy, beautiful purple bird um, feeding on white bark pine cones, white bark pine nuts in the Rocky Mountains, and they might be like, good gracious, what a gorgeous bird. I'm so happy to learn about that bird. And they look and be like, Stellar's Jail, Jay, I'm getting out of this birding. Mm. I, think, I think the people... I'm done birding. I think the people that... And I don't buy that. ...are uh, behind this in... in using all this energy to go through and change the names of 70 some birds just because they're named after dudes or people. If they took that energy and put that into preserving habitat for these birds to live in, we, we would all be living in a better world. I say that's that. my two cents on yep. it. I, 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 yeah, I just, I was with them and now I just think it's, yeah, uh, I'm not with them. I do. No, no, no. I understood the surgical occasional renaming. I just think that like the 70 thing, I just felt like, felt like a publicity stunt. Yeah, yeah. If it's named after something that's like offensive to someone, obviously. I think that, but it's I think that's the, that, that was the premise that there are certain people who might or do find. Um, offended the, just by the fact of offended by the ethnicity of someone that named a bird. That's, that's very possible because I don't know for myself the full you know, 70 that have been, that have been listed. Well, that, that's what they're saying. They're saying that not that you're offended by a specific thing that you'd look and be like, it's offensive to me. Um, that that individual's distant relatives hailed from Western Europe. If, if that's that, that's kind of the definition of reverse racism in my opinion. Yeah. You want to know more something about birds? Sure. Now, every boy dreams of being, uh, uh, making his, uh, not every boy, many boys dream of one day growing up and being like a trapper, or a commercial, you know, hunter, a commercial mm -hmm. fisherman. Like you make your living out hunting. Yep. Well, these fellas in Montana got in that business all the wrong way. Uh oh. They got into the golden and bald eagle. Oh, I read about what? this. Mm. Business. Oh, yeah. Ruh -ruh. See. <laughs> These dudes did some, it was an orchestrated thing. Yeah, they were big time. Mm -hmm. um, Over a number of years, right? Yeah. So they were selling on the black market. 
Um, at pretty good prices. Like, surprisingly good prices, speaking of birds. Uh, two guys, I don't need, I don't want to give their name. I mean, you can find their name. They're in Montana, but, you know, it's, I don't want to give their name. Uh, 3,600 is the number they, they're indicted on killing for the mar- commercial market. 3,600 golden and bald eagles. Oof. Now, s- social media. I remember one time we were in Missouri. No, we were in Kentucky, and I met a game warden in the game. We were talking about being out in the field. And I remember he was the, one of the first people that ever expressed to me any unease about suppressors. And he was talking about, man, that, uh, you know, I was actually talking to a handful of game wardens. I can't remember which one said what, but one of these game wardens was saying, I really rely on that crack of a rifle. And he said, hey, I'll be out in my tree stand and pow, off in the distance. And he'd be like, something about that ain't right. And he said, I'll be down out of my tree heading over there and catching poachers. And so he's like, with suppressors, I worry about losing that tool. And a game warden said, I don't need to go into the field anymore. I have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so he gains more time in his tree stand though. Yeah. That's, he can Facebook in his tree stand. So this guy had made this guy had tech so this is not social media, but he had text messaged um people. Uh he had text messaged a guy, you know, like basically, what are you doing? I'm out here committing felonies. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, they texted him. They knew it, man. <laughs> and another message, he said, he was out on a killing spree. Jeez. They illegally sold the uh, on the black market. The United States and elsewhere. They ran their scheme from January 2015 through March 2021. They sold wings and tails. Does it say how they got busted? Was it like a sting? Um, I, I can't remember now. What are people doing with the wings and tails? Just 350 bucks a pop. They were making up to $350. Oh my God. Um, that doesn't per sound, bird. That sounds low. A little low. No. Knowing per that ball, you're like committing eight, a felony and you're selling it for 350 with inflation? Yeah, but you could probably with eat. inflation. <laughs> yeah, but they're probably. I mean, I don't. I'd, I'd have to spend more time on it. But I mean, if you got on a, if you got on the right deer carcass or two, you you, you, you sit down and shoot a thousand bucks with eagles. Yeah. Oh, and all yeah. you and all you're doing is like for processing, you're taking the tail and the wings off. It's dude. Uh, that strikes me as real easy money. Well, yeah. He could probably go set a bunch of leg holds around a carcass and have a thousand bucks worth of eagles sitting there when he goes to check it. You know, I mean, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but if that guy set up shop in southeast Alaska, oh, he'd buy a private plane. <laughs> <laughs> yep, on a dumpster in southeast Alaska. He doesn't even have to. <laughs> yes, in town you know, yeah. <laughs> um. So from April 30, 2020 through March 13th, 21, that's a long time, okay? They sold or offered to sell the parts of whole birds, the parts or whole birds from two bald eagles and 11 golden eagles. Uh, One of these guys would travel from the state of Washington out to an Indian reservation in Montana to shoot in and around a reservation area for whatever reason. I think one of the guys lived on the reservation. He did. Um, In one instance, on March 13th, 2021, the two men, quote, returned to a previously killed deer to lure in eagles. All right, so they had killed a deer to lure in eagles. Facing up to 18 years behind bars. One of them 18 years and one of them facing up to 15 years behind bars. Good. I'm surprised that's it. Yeah, but you know what? I, I bet mean, it would be a lot worse if they hadn't been delisted. Because, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's if they a had felony done it, to If they had one? done it in the 70s, if they had done it in the 70s, it'd be 
So it's not a federal offense. There's probably multiple felonies, right? It's probably felony to kill it and then felony to sell it. And then there's probably, you know, if you're going international, there's probably. Yeah, and there's thousands. That's, like, a, good, that's a good question. Are they in how, federal or not federal? How many felonies? Seems like there's a lot of felonies. A there. lot of felonies. Um, when, I, when I think of a felony, I think of a lot more jail time than that. Where, uh, yeah, where are they indicted? Hold on a minute. Depends on the felony. Yeah. A couple of them deer coming in felt like they were coming into a sting. It seemed like <laughs> yeah, <That's the> rattling, <laughs> like coming on yeah. and be like, oh, ooh, no, ooh. it's federal. So they're in Talk. federal. <laughs> it's Bust. it's a federal deal. You know why it's federal? Because it'd be Lacey Act, right? Because it'd the, be federal mm-hmm. anyways. Because they're crossing state lines mm-hmm. to commit a crime. So it's automatically the nation. Well, because of seems like it should be federal. Yeah, well, it would be picked up as federal because when you commit a state wildlife crime, when you cross state lines to to break a state's wildlife law, it becomes federal. Yeah, like if you kidnap someone and drive them across, if you were to kidnap someone in in Texas and drive into Oklahoma, you you're now that's a federal charge. It ceases to be state and goes federal. Yep. So because of the Lacey Act, um, they're moving wildlife parts across state lines, and it became a federal U.S. District Court. One of them was a shooter and one of them was a shipper. One of them was from the, yeah, one of them lived on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Hmm. I wonder if they thought they'd get around it somehow by being on the reservation. I had to read more. If he's a tribal member, they might have thought they were covered by something, and, and I don't mm-hmm. I don't really know why they're not. Yeah. We'll do a better job reporting on this next time we're out. Next time we're out hog hunting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any other Sorry pigs come in. Sorry about your ears, everyone. Oh, there's like. No, oh, there's some there's way one. out. Yeah. 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 That w- and then they're all they're all out. Oh, are left they? Left over there oh, yeah. a couple hundred yards. Recent news story about the schizophrenia, cat ownership and schizo- schizophrenia. We recently covered a, uh, we found out, I've been real interested in people dropping stuff into toilet vaults and then getting, going in there and getting stuck in there. <laughs> oh, like national forest spots? Yeah. Fishing access sites yeah. seem to be access. a real magnet. Yeah. Oh, that's where the most of them happen? So I'm going to say this, I'm going to say to you, Chris, I'm going to say, did you listen to the episode where we had the guys on who rescued someone from a vault toilet? And you're going to say, well, no, not that one. I had not listened to that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do a lot of podcasting. So, I, got a, I got a fresh baby. That, so, might have, that might have preceded her, though. No, it did. So, again, uh, there was a, there was a, a high pro, uh, a case of international significance where someone got stuck in a vault toilet <laughs> and got rescued. Then later... A, a woman got stuck in a vault toilet trying to fetch her watch out of there. And uh, they couldn't figure out how to get her out because they were trying to take her up through the toilet seat. Oh. But one of the responding officers had listened to the podcast. <laughs> so he knew. He's like, hey, I listened to a podcast about this. You can actually remove the pedestal and fish the person right out of the hole beneath the pedestal. Oh, yeah. Save the day. Such a wealth of information. We've saved, I don't know how many lives, (laughs) because tourniquet stuff, we are, I know, I keep expecting, like, you know when you can get that presidential commendation, dude? (laughs) Yeah. Medal of Freedom? (laughs) Someday, uh, I'm going to be down there, I'm going to be down there at the State of the Union address, (laughs) and, like, Trump's going to be like, tonight we're honoring. (laughs) 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 And it's going to be... And it's going to be us about tourniquets and how to get people out of vault toilets. <laughs> um, so there's then a, there's like a rash of these vault toilet tragedies, near tragedies. Uh, so we're going to close because, they, oh, oh, back to this. So we realized, some, I don't know who found this guy. There's a guy that sings the news. He's so he, talented. He takes news stories and Reed. writes songs. So you don't have to read the news. You can just listen to his songs where he covers the news with piano accompaniment. Oh, that sounds Reed's great. Reads yeah. piano news. Reads piano news. So he <laughs> writes a song about the news story, 
puts the news story up on social media on one screen, and the other half is him performing his song about the news. So he did the news on this vault toilet issue. Um, and he says, uh, it starts with him saying, if I dropped my watch into some public excretion, I say, that's it for me, dog. <laughs> uh, and he has done one. We're going to close with it. Uh, our license on the very controversial ride on by Christopher Denny has expired. And Corinne, rather than renewing our, rather than forking over our few thousand bucks that it costs us to have Chris Denny's ride on, for a year we're gonna switch to only using music that our listeners write and perform we've gotten a ton of submissions already oh that's so a cool idea man chester yeah. the midwester we use some dog dirt and dirt send one over all right oh, oh yeah you dude, got dirt. to Why not send yeah. one over man yeah, I will. You do, I man. Didn't, yeah i will and if you're not all musical you could do like spoken word poetry too yeah <laughs> <laughs> The music is nice. Yeah, yeah that's true. I do like, I, I started listening to that dude. Like Henry Rollins? Yeah. I take that back, everybody. We need the music. So for 20, so for 20, 2024, we're only using listener sourced music to close the show. And we're not going to tell you who's doing it every time, but every time you'll find it in the show liner notes. And we're only telling you who's doing it now because we're kicking the whole thing off. And we so this is the first one, we right? We commissioned this. We commissioned it. We yeah. sent him, hey, you like and singing Reed's about just, the news? Yeah, he's Why don't you sing so about good. cats and schizophrenia? <laughs> <laughs> so he composed original music. If you don't like to read, even though you already heard the story because we just talked about it, let's just say you hadn't or you skipped that part. Here now, you can hear the news saying to you. Oh, but he riffs off it. And it, you know, Siamese cats are involved in this. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Schizophrenia, Siamese cats. You see where this is going. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, dig in. We're going to go gut Corinne's hog. And stick around for the chapter of the oh, long. Oh, and, and after the song. Yeah. Oh, shoot, man. How many people are we going to lose because they're going to hear the end music and turn it off and not? I already told them about it. Guys, yeah, long, long. just listen, stick this, around. You gotta listen. stick around. That yeah. long hunter thing is gonna be oh, good, man. Do Reed's piano music, and then stay tuned for chapter seven of Meat Eaters: American History: The Long Hunters, seventeen sixty one to seventeen seventy five. And remind you, what comes after seventeen seventy five? The Revolution, seventeen seventy six. Yeah. So if you're wondering, like, why those age brackets, you will find out when you listen. That why, what did Daniel Boone and the boys who hunted deer, why did their era end with the revolution? You don't know. I have no idea. I'm going <laughs> to tell you, Chris damn sure don't know from what I found out about him today. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to tell because I don't know if his mom listens. <laughs> <laughs> Does she listen more than you? Because yeah, if not, she's not going to hear it. <laughs> I, uh, she, she, I don't know if she knows what a podcast she'll be like, is, man. she like, I didn't listen to that episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, stay tuned for uh, Reed's, what's it called? Reed's Piano News. Reed's Piano News, Chapter 7 of Long Hunters. Thank you, guys. I got a sign.
Chapter 7, Gearing Up. Becoming a successful long hunter required more than steely nerves, a hunger for adventure, and an intimate knowledge of the landscape and wildlife of the first far west. Without the right tools, you were not going to last long. In 1769, a large party of long hunters, some 20 or more, assembled in the frontier settlements along the New River in western Virginia. The men had plans to hunt the Cumberland River drainage on the far side of the Cumberland Gap. You'll recognize some of their names. Casper Mansker, the Bledsoe brothers, and John Baker. Two years earlier, Baker had been on that ill-fated trip to New Orleans where his party boated their hides down the Mississippi, sold them off, and got robbed of their cash on the way home. Despite the obvious risks, the call of opportunity prevailed. Setting out in June, this newly assembled party took the warrior's path across the headwaters of the Tennessee River. Moving through the Cumberland Gap to the Cumberland River, they then traveled downstream to where Meadow Creek flowed in. That's where they'd set up their station camp, in a spot known as Price's Meadow. If you're looking for that place today, it's on the south side of the Cumberland River. You can just look for a historical marker near Rubbin' Butts Barbecue. The party broke up into groups of three or four hunters, and they got after it. Every five weeks, the groups planned to return to their station camp with their harvests of hides loaded on their horses. The hunt was successful. Within a few months, the party had amassed some 500 white-tailed deer skins. But one day, a group of 25 Cherokees discovered their camp while the men were out hunting. The Cherokees stole the long hunter's cash and some of their gunpowder. They also took off with some clothing, pots, and kettles. With what little gunpowder the long hunters had left, continuing to hunt would have been futile. So Isaac Bledsoe rode back to the settlements with some of the men to resupply. Upon their return, the hunt resumed. The men hunted until April of 1770, when half the party hauled a pack train of deer skins and furs back east. Casper Mansker and the remainder of the long hunters stayed behind. They decided to build two boats and two trapping canoes, which would have been made from bark sewn over a frame of lashed saplings. They also made use of a third boat that had been abandoned on site perhaps by French hunters or traders. The hunters loaded up their hides and meat and gear and started to head down river to the colonial settlement of Natchez on the Mississippi. This was an incredible journey of hundreds of river miles. The men would have canoed down the Cumberland River to the Ohio, down the Ohio to the Mississippi, and down the Mississippi to Natchez. At French Lick, the present-day site of Nashville, Tennessee, they saw what was by all accounts the largest number of buffalo and wild game they had ever encountered in any one place. After killing a few of the animals and using their hides to cover their open boats, they continued downriver until they reached the mouth of the Cumberland. At this point, the men were dealing with some spoilage in the bear meat that they'd harvested back in the Cumberland River country. Not surprising given the length of their journey and this being the warmer months of the year. So they decided to convert some of the bear meat into bear grease. To do this, they would have discarded the lean red meat and retained just the fat. They then simmer the fat in kettles to separate the oil or grease from the solids. The valuable grease would have likely been sewn into sacks made of deer, elk, or buffalo hide. During this process of rendering bear grease, they get robbed again. A war party of Chickasaws makes off with their guns and ammunition. At this point, you'd be justified in assuming that this long hunting party would come to an end. I mean, enough bad luck is enough, right? But it does not come to an end. The Chickasaws didn't take the white men's oils or furs. So the hunters continue downstream and they eventually are able to sell their skins and bear grease in Natchez. After the sale, some of the men commence their journey homeward. 
But Casper Mansker stays a while in Natchez, likely because he seems to have gotten sick. Upon recovering, he too sets out for home, traveling upriver in a boat with John Baker. The two men eventually join up with a party of horse traders who are heading overland to Georgia. Mansker and Baker then break off from the horse traders and cut north through East Tennessee and then, finally, onto the New River, likely arriving in late summer or early autumn after more than a year away from home. Now that is what you would call a long hunt. There's a lot to take in about that story. One of the main things that might have surprised you was the way the Native American hunters took some supplies from the hunting party that they saw as trespassers, but they didn't take everything from them. In the following chapter, we'll be talking about why something like that might happen. But what we're going to dive into here is the critical nature of those supplies and equipment used by the long hunters. From guns and ammunition to knives and hatchets, we're going to cover the gear that allowed them to do what they did. We'll begin with one of the most iconic pieces of the long hunter's kit, the Kentucky rifle, also known as the Kentucky long rifle. Not only is it central to their adventures, it remains one of the most legendary guns in American history. The rifles weren't just renowned for their function and aesthetic. These were the first uniquely American firearms. We're going to get into some finer details about these guns, but let's first cover the very basics. The long hunters hunted with flintlock muzzleloading rifles. We'll get to the flintlock part in a few minutes. But let's first look at what specifically a muzzleloader is by talking about what it is not. If you look at your standard rifle or shotgun that you're going to use for this year's deer or duck season, you'll see that the shell is loaded into the breech of the gun, meaning it's loaded into the end of the barrel that you're standing at, not the end where the bullet comes out. Well, that's the defining feature of a muzzleloader. A muzzle loader is loaded from the muzzle end or the front opening of the barrel. And these guns weren't loaded with complete cartridges that combined primer, gunpowder, and a lead projectile in a brass casing. Instead, the load, or shell as we call it, was assembled by the hunter inside the barrel. First, a hunter would pour a charge of loose gunpowder down the barrel. They could measure it out or just take a good guess and free pour it. Then they'd take the bullet, which was a simple lead ball, and wrap it in a patch, a greased piece of fabric or thin leather that cradled the ball, like how a Hershey's Kiss is cradled in its wrapping of aluminum foil. That package of ball and patch would be shoved down the barrel with a ramrod. It was a pretty tight fit. Now, it's important to keep in mind that all Kentucky long rifles were muzzle loaders, but not all muzzle loaders were Kentucky long rifles. And it's also important to note that the long hunters journeying into Kentucky wouldn't have said they were carrying Kentucky long rifles. That name didn't take hold until later, in the 1780s, and in fact, it was something of a misnomer then as the rifles would be more accurately associated with Pennsylvania, where they took on their defining characteristics. You'll actually see them referred to as Pennsylvania rifles here and there in the historical record. So, this can all be a bit confusing. Whether you call them Kentucky rifles or Pennsylvania rifles, these iconic weapons derive from a predecessor weapon that arrived in North America with distinctly European roots. That early gun, the Jaeger, was shaped by a combination of two key design features. One was German, and it's called rifling. Now, we mentioned this word a minute ago, and it's important as rifling is where the word rifle comes from. Rifling refers to the spiral grooves that are cut into the inside or bore of a rifle's barrel. Historians disagree on how this innovation came to be, but regardless, Rifling is what gives a slug or projectile its spin. Just like a good spiral pass with a football, a spinning projectile is stable in flight and thus much more accurate. 
We just explained how a muzzleloading rifle is loaded with the fully assembled load of powder, patch, and ball crammed down the end of the barrel. Well, the only thing left to do in order to make that gun go boom is somehow ignite the gunpowder. That's where the term flintlock comes into play. The flintlock ignition system was a design tradition that came from the French, or rather, it exploded out of Paris with much enthusiasm. This ignition system replaced earlier, cruder mechanisms designed for the same purpose. The flintlock system featured a spring-loaded hammer that was fitted with a small chunk of flint held in place by a clamp. Pull the rifle's trigger, and the hammer crashed down on a hinged piece of steel that flung open to reveal a small pan of gunpowder. In a synchronized bit of wonderment, the flint hitting the steel created a flash of sparks that landed right into the now-exposed pan of powder, igniting it. The flames from this ignition would jump through a touch hole in the side of the barrel and ignite the much bigger load of gunpowder within. Bang! Or rather, boom! Out comes the lead ball, spinning smooth and fast thanks to the rifling. As an aside, when you hear somebody say a flash in the pan to describe something short-lived or less than promised, that's where the saying comes from. A little blast of powder that failed to ignite the main charge. When German gunsmiths, the pioneers of rifling, adopted the French flintlock, the result was this rifle known as a Jaeger. Now, for you connoisseurs of Jägermeister, that's German for hunter. So how did we get a uniquely American gun from this European lineage? Well, Jaegers came to North America in the 1700s with the German immigrants who would settle in the Lancaster Valley of Pennsylvania. Lancaster became the largest western town in colonial America. And as it grew, and as folks migrated from there down through the Shenandoah Valley, those gunsmithing traditions spread. Now, keep in mind, these guns back then, these muzzle loaders, were entirely handmade. Every spring and screw and piece of metal, no matter how small, was built by the hands of an individual gunsmith. There are an infinite number of little details we could get into about this process, but here's just one. The barrel started out as flat pieces of metal, basically long, flat bars, that were actually hammered into cylinders. The hole in the middle of one of these cylinders would be smoothed, polished, and rifled, we'll explain that in a minute too, with nothing but crude hand tools. The making of these rifles was an intricate expression of the finest craftsmanship. And these designs evolved not in a boardroom or in the R&D lab of some company, but in the hands of individual gunsmiths working on individual guns informed by the feedback of individual customers. Two further innovations took place that would turn the Jaeger into the Kentucky rifle, and they both happened in the new world. One was a lengthening of the barrel, which would typically be 40 to 48 inches long. The iconic long barrel gave the charge of powder more time to fully ignite, increasing the shot's velocity, and the longer trajectory out of the barrel also increased accuracy by stabilizing the projectile's path. The second innovation that defined the Kentucky rifle was a shrinking of the bore size, which meant the gun fired a smaller projectile. European guns at the time traditionally shot larger projectiles, up to 75 caliber or more, meaning a sphere of lead about three quarters of an inch wide. For a long hunter in particular, there was an obvious advantage to the smaller bore. It helped reduce the amount of powder and lead they needed to carry with them into the backcountry. Back in those days, they weren't talking in the same caliber nomenclatures used today. Their common unit of measurement for bore diameter was how many balls for a particular rifle could be produced from a single pound of lead, which would translate roughly to how many deer could be killed with a single pound of lead. Think of a modern-day conversation about fuel economy in cars. Someone might say, 
my car gets 25 miles to the gallon of gas. Well, a long hunter might note that his gun got 48 shots to the pound of lead. One source described Pennsylvania rifles in general as firing, quote, a ball no larger than 36 to the pound, which would be a 53 caliber, meaning a bore diameter of 0.53 inches. So just barely over a half inch wide. For comparison's sake, a roughly 45 caliber rifle, which was preferred by most long hunters, would get about 40 to 48 balls per pound of lead. I'll point out that this balls per pound of lead measurement is actually where our contemporary shotgun gauge system that we use today comes from. When you hear a shotgun described as a 12 gauge or 20 gauge, that's a reference to how many lead balls of a particular diameter you can make out of a pound of lead. Meaning, if you cast 12 spherical lead balls with the diameter matching the diameter of the barrel of your 12-gauge shotgun, they would add up to one pound. Likewise, if you divide a single pound of lead into 20 equal spheres, those spheres would be the bore diameter of your 20-gauge shotgun. The long hunters and their contemporaries thought of rifles and ammunition in this way balls per pound because they weren't carrying a set quantity of round balls or bullets into the backcountry. They were casting these projectiles themselves out of bars of lead. This was the most efficient means of transporting all of the ammunition they'd need in the first far west. They hauled their lead in bars that weighed several pounds each. Then to form bullets, they would cast that lead into round projectiles over a campfire by pouring molten lead into a cast. Achieving some level of consistency was important. Bullets needed to be smooth and relatively clean of creases, seams, and pitting. We can only imagine that casting bullets must have been a frequent activity at the station camps where the long hunters deposited their skins and stored their supplies. Stores of lead and melting ladles, which they'd used to melt and pour their lead, were communal gear that was left at camp but each individual hunter would have had a bullet cast that matched his own rifle. Keep in mind, these weapons were all handmade by individual gunsmiths, and each had their own unique irregularities and specifications. Another chore required to keep their guns running would have been napping or shaping flint from fist-sized pieces of suitable rock, chert or obsidian, the same types of rock that Native Americans used to make arrowheads. This flint, when struck against steel, was what produced the spark. Although we don't have any sort of detailed insight on this point through Lyman Draper or our other sources, we can only imagine that the long hunters would keep in camp a store of chert or other tool stone that they could shape into flints. If they did run out, this was one supply that would have been relatively easy for them to source out in the field. Gunpowder was something else long hunters might have known how to produce on their own in a pinch. It could be made from a concoction of bat guano, sulfur, wood ash, and a dousing of their own urine. But all available evidence suggests they simply purchased powder back in the settlements outside of the most dire circumstances. High-quality gunpowder imported from Great Britain and her other colonies was readily available, and it was cheap so cheap that domestic manufacture of gunpowder in the colonies that became the United States was not economically viable. There were exceptions in periods when trade was interrupted or when Great Britain was in a state of war and restricted the supply of gunpowder going outside of its borders. But generally, gunpowder in the colonies came from overseas and it was abundant. Accounts frequently mentioned that the long hunters set out with large supplies of lead and powder. They'd transport this powder and store it in their station camps in larger containers, probably small kegs, but individual hunters would carry their powder in the field in a powder horn, another essential piece of gear. Made from the horn of a cow or buffalo, it would be fitted with a stopper at the pointy end and used to pour a charge of powder down the muzzle of the gun. As we saw at the top of this chapter, those supplies, along with the rifles themselves, 
were sometimes seized by Native Americans when they ran into parties of white men hunting on their land. The long hunter's rifles made an attractive prize because they were way better than the type of guns, the so-called trade guns, that were in wide circulation among Native people. These trade guns were smoothbore guns or muskets that were produced relatively cheaply in Europe and were frequently traded with the Native Americans by the colonial deerskin traders in exchange for deer hides. Smoothbore guns had smooth bores, so none of the rifling or spiraling grooves that gave the Kentucky rifle its accuracy by forcing bullets to spin as they exited the barrel. But smoothbore guns could be loaded more quickly and, again, could be produced more cheaply. You could outfit an army with smoothbore guns for less money. So they were around. But when Native Americans ran into parties of long hunters on their traditional hunting grounds, they would often take the opportunity to, let's say, exchange those smoothbore guns for the long hunter's Kentucky rifles. We'll be hearing more about this interesting dynamic of theft and trade in the following chapter. There's a lot more to say. To get back to the elements that comprise the long hunter's kit, Other than their rifles and necessary paraphernalia, the cutting tools carried by long hunters were the most essential pieces of gear they had. Many would have carried what was then called a clasp or folder knife, what we would today just call a pocket knife or a jackknife. They also carried larger fixed blade knives commonly described in the historic record as butcher knives or sometimes scalping knives. Six to ten inches long, they were used for all manner of purposes. Eating, skinning, fighting, whittling, carving, and yes, at times, removing human scalps. Most blades were imported from Europe, typically without handles. The owner would fashion and attach their own. Some surviving examples from this period have handles made from deer antlers. These would have been in ready supply given the occupation of the long hunters. And if you hear of a stag handle knife, that's what they were talking about, the antler handle. Modern blade steels are much stronger than what they had around then, and our knives hold a sharper edge than could be expected of the blades carried by long hunters. This meant they would frequently need to sharpen their knives, quite likely with stones found nearby. A smooth and wet river cobble would have been an adequate tool to sharpen the soft steel that was in use back then. As ubiquitous as these knives were, a small axe was just as critical to the long hunter's kit. Some folks might use the words hatchets, belt axes, and tomahawks interchangeably today, but to the long hunters, there were key distinctions. Long hunters like Boone would have carried a belt axe. These were hung from the belt or carried on a shoulder strap and secured beneath the belt. They were smaller than what you might be picturing maybe 12 inches or so overall, and weighing less than a pound. The head of the axe had a squarish appearance. The pole, the end opposite the bit or cutting surface, was flat and rectangular and could be used as a hammer for any number of tasks. The eye, or the opening in which the handle was seated, was a tapered oblong shape. As they would with a knife, the owner of a belt axe would commonly need to haft it or put a handle on it themselves. These belt axes were different from a round-poled, round-eyed trade axe, that sleek, distinctive profile we would most commonly call a tomahawk, and from the long axes these men would have carried on their horses for use in shelter building or other big projects. We can certainly imagine that when Casper Mansker and his contingent decided to build canoes for that long ride downriver to Natchez, They would have used belt axes to peel away the sheaves of elm bark used for the holes of the boats. For butchering bison and elk, setting traps, shaping and pounding stakes for shelter, and any number of other tasks in which long hunters had to reshape some part of their environment to better suit their needs, the belt axe was indispensable. When it came to equipment, Long hunters needed practical, utilitarian items that served multiple purposes and that they could repair themselves. 
They had to shoe horses, do leather work, and build all manner of items necessary to the hunt, such as canoes, shelters, and fur and hide handling equipment, like fleshing beams and stretching boards. Steel traps cost 6 to $8 a piece back then, making them one of the most significant costs of a long hunt. Tuning and repairing traps required the skill set of a blacksmith, as they often needed to fabricate trap parts, including pans and triggers. Gunsmithing skills were essential. Boone and likely other long hunters could skillfully restock a rifle, repair and replace parts, nap flints for the ignition system, and generally troubleshoot any issues that arose with a rifle while on the hunt. Among the tools they would bring were files, bellows to heat up the fire for metalworking purposes, and what they called a hand vice. Also known as a gunsmith's vice or a clockmaker's vice, a hand vice was used to hold small objects being worked on. Picture a large pair of tweezers with wider jaws or the type of pliers you'd use for putting seams in sheet metal. The jaws were spring-loaded and tightened with a wing nut and screw. Long hunters also traveled with what's called a screw plate, a plate of iron with different sized thread holes cut into it forcing a piece of metal through the holes that would impart an external thread to a screw's surface. If you've done some basic machining, you're probably familiar with what it looks like to tap a hole using a cutting implement to create or clean up internal threads. This is a bit like the inverse of that process, and they would have used it to fashion replacement hardware for their rifles or traps. It's remarkable to consider that the long hunters and other travelers in the backcountry were actually fabricating metal parts. Today, you might bring along a multi-tool on a long backcountry hunt. These guys were bringing along complete miniature workshops. Awls, which were tools used to punch holes in leather, were another vital piece of equipment often mentioned in the sources. These would sometimes fold out from the backside of a clasp knife. The reason the awl was so indispensable is quite simple. In addition to being metal workers, occasional gunsmiths, and woodworkers, the long hunters were also cobblers. And that's because one item that would have been in constant need of repair or replacement was their footwear, the moccasins they fashioned from elk and buffalo hides. You'll recall that these elk and buffalo hides were thicker and heavier than the deer skins that were the long hunter's primary target. These thicker skins made for more durable footwear but they still required constant maintenance. A pair of moccasins might only take a long hunter a few hours to make, but repairing them was probably a task that required near daily attention. We do know that anyone spending time outdoors in this time was very much aware of the risks of getting cold. One source describes hunters in the late 1700s as apprehensive of rheumatism a term then used to describe rheumatoid arthritis. They blamed rheumatism on cold feet and slept in their half-faced shelters with their feet to the fire in hopes of warming them and drying out their moccasins. It's probably safe to assume that many of them had circulation issues and numbness from wearing wet moccasins year-round. But every mile in wet moccasins and every cold night was endured with a single objective in mind. Henry Skaggs, Daniel Boone, Casper Mansker, and their companions weren't simply equipping themselves to survive the first far west, although that in and of itself was not an easy task. Their tools were all a means to an end. They had a very specific labor-intensive purpose to their travels, producing deerskins in large volume for the commercial market. But of course, they were not the only hunters on the landscape of the first far west. <laughs> 